I think I was saying fast, so I better just give that up. We're all feeling the time crunch tonight, but that's all right. We're going to give it to the Lord, and we're going to trust Him. But we're singing in Isaiah. And even though you've not been with us tonight, no worries. This is a part three, but it's easy for you to catch on and come forward with us because it's, it stems from Isaiah, Yeshayahu, chapter 40. In the seven weeks prior to Rosh Hashanah, we say in the book of Isaiah for every single Haftor portion that's somewhere in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah speaks to us greatly of comfort, and these are the Shabbats of comfort. We've had the Shabbats of rebuke, the, the corrections, and then we come into the time of comfort, and then we go into the time where we're very much introspective and we're looking at ourselves and trying to make everything right, and that builds up toward Yom Kippur. But we'll talk more about that, especially starting next week, because we are going to be weaving into our time to go into the High Holy Days, which are uh, critically important, and the, the beautiful picture, the, uh, every one of our High Holy Days is a picture of our Messiah. It's said that uh, the veil of blindness is over the eyes of many Jewish people, and they do not see and understand that we're here to share it and to try to help them recognize what is right there in their very own scriptures. Uh, when we started with chapter 40 of Isaiah, we realized in chapter 39 is talking about going into captivity. Chapter 40, the comfort is that they're going to be brought back. It's looking toward the Messianic era. It's looking toward the re future redemption of Israel. It's looking toward uh, the restoration of the Jewish people in their land. And we're still crying for that today because as long as we have Jewish people anywhere outside the land, we know that there's a tag and a call and a time that we are to go home. And there will be that day that, that uh, is beautifully depicted in scripture saying that we will come from the four corners of the earth and we will be brought back to Israel. We will come into Jerusalem. Our Messiah will sit on the throne in Jerusalem, comma, Israel. I love to say that, the eternal capital according to our God, <laughs> and we will see that, that all the promises that God has made being fulfilled at that time. But as we go through this chapter, as we look at it, and we, we're staying on it long enough to really cover it thoroughly because it is such a comfort and because it is so important, we see that they go from a time of lamenting because they are being cast out of Jerusalem, and yet God is speaking to them that comfort, that he's giving them that there's a final chapter coming. This is not the end of the story. And we saw that starting right in the beginning, the comfort you, comfort you, we, we can look at the it, saying it twice for our two temples that have been destroyed, regardless of whether that's exactly what was meant or not, although I believe that it, it was, still we know that that word comfort from our Hebrew is that sigh of relief. Whew. What a change. And as we went through that last week and we talked much about God's word, God breathes and what it breathes into us and that the key is thus says the Lord, not anyone else, but what does the Lord say? We saw that he said, comfort my people. Now they're going into captivity because of disobedience. They're going into captivity because of rebellion against God and his laws. And yet God is not saying, I disown you. And we need to make that very clear. No room for replacement theology anywhere in the scriptures. He continually calls them my people and that he is their God. And he shows right in the first two, the verses two and three, proleptically looking to the future as if it's completed that they've been, uh, their warfare is over, their iniquity has been pardoned. They have, in essence, have received double for the sins that they have done so that the, none, nothing can come at them. No one can say, well, you deserve punishment for this. No, it's been done. It's been taken care of. It's been removed for them. And they, they needed to hold on to that at a time when they're wondering, what about our promises? What, how can we go out of this land and Messiah is going to come? What about the promises to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And yet, this is why the Lord has put this in here. The voice crying out in the wilderness in verse 3, clear the way for the Lord. And we talked before about how there is a path that needs to be made that will bring our people to that redemption, that they need to repent, that they cannot feel self-sufficient, that they cannot think that they are fine in themselves. And the scripture is so clear here, even as we looked at it in detail before, shows a coming of the Messiah once and a coming again of Messiah. 
it goes into the fact that at this time, at the second coming of Messiah, that then, verse 5, the glory of the Lord would be revealed. And we looked at how that's an actual time. That we're not just looking at the character of our God, his attributes of glory, but we're looking at from the, the verbiage, from the, the way that it is given in the Hebrew, we're looking at a specific time when his character will be displayed on the face of this earth. We see the contrast of that, verses 6 through 8, we saw how frail man gets, how temporary life is, that the flower fades, the, the, um, the grass withers, but the word of God stands forever. We went from that infallible God-breathed word that gives comfort, that this whole chapter is about that comfort that God is promising to any who come to him, and we saw in that, that, uh, um, well, verse 9 sums it up quickly and easily for us, where at the very end of it, in your English, it says, here is your God. That I told you how from the Hebrew, really, what it's saying is, behold, hello, wake up, don't miss it, behold, your God. And I encourage you to take those words with you as you go out the door last week, no matter what comes into your life, behold, your God. God. It's personal. He is your God if you have that relationship with him. And behold, he, we talked about how he is the God of creation, the mighty God that created. I gave you example and scientifically speaking of how great, how magnanimous our God, how mind-blowing to us. And this is the God who is personally involved in your life. I don't have time to tell you, but I encouraged you to, to see that no matter what trial you came into during the week to see how great your God is, and when you see how great he is, how small your problem is. And I can tell you that I personally came to the front door of my sister this week in an attempt twice for her house to be set on fire by someone who was out of their mind, and God protected my sister Hallelujah. twice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All I could think of was, behold, you're hurt. God and even gave those words to my sister in comfort also as she knows her God too and is clinging to him and trusting him as these steps unveil in her life and we all have. Uh, Bruce alluded to it earlier and I've heard a, a pastor say it that everyone is either going into a trial in a trial or coming out of a trial and really <laughs> I think that we can all relate that's pretty well there. The verses 9 through 26 are telling us that God is a God of all comfort. That there's nothing he cannot do. He's the deliverer. He's the rewarder. He's the shepherd. He's the king. His arm is saving. When we focus on how great our God is, our problems do shrink. We do suddenly realize, what me worry when I've got so great a God on my side? That it really, we, we shame on us when we allow fear to come into our lives and knock out the focus we should have. Because verse 12 showed us God is omnipotent. That means he is all powerful. He transcends the universe. If he transcends this universe, if he keeps this universe in order, if he is beyond the universe and not, not confined by it, then what have we to fear? In his wisdom, verses 13 and 14, he is omniscient. He is the eternal God who is all wise. He knows everything. It's not catching him by surprise. And I love how a friend of mine says, you never find God pacing in front of his throne. <laughs> he is always seated <laughs> and at peace. Verses 15 through 17 showed us his sovereignty, that God is absolute. He is sovereign. Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. And we're even told in Scripture, God raises the leaders up, both the good and the bad, for his purposes. And we saw that his throne is in the heavens. His throne is so large it does not even fit on this earth. Yes, he'll sit on an earthly throne. He's promised David that he would have one who would sit on his throne forever. But he is greater. His sovereignty is over the heavens. That was in Tehillim Psalm 103 and Psalm 115. We looked at it last time. And then those verses, 18 to 26, where we saw how infinite. No limit to our God. No limit. Is his hand cut short that he cannot save? Really? Oh, I, I mean, against that backdrop, how can we have a problem when we have an incomparable God? 
as we go on now, we're looking at verses 27 and 28. We might, even though we started late, get to the end. And if we don't, we'll bring it back next week. <laughs> but looking at it, we're going to see now the comparison with the wrong focus. You see, we've got to have 2020 vision. We've got to have our focus on our Lord. We cannot allow us to ourselves to look at circumstances to look at anything that gets in the way and causes our focus of God to be less than sharp and less than clear. And so Yeshua brings this out because he wants to comfort Israel every way. He wants them to have nowhere to turn and not know and feel and sense and believe in this comfort of their God. And so he gives them two why questions. You know, we love to ask why. <laughs> you can ask why in two different ways also. You can ask why with a fist clenched, and I don't advise it. <laughs> but you can ask why with your hand right open, and God will meet you and talk with you and give you that intimate conversation that he's given to us in his very word and through the gift of intimate prayer. Both those ways. There's there, How else, if you want to know someone, you want to know them intimately, you listen to them, you talk with them, you spend time with them, and that's why I encourage you. If you're not feeling the intimacy of your God, if you're not feeling his love, if you don't know his wisdom, his omnipotence, his all power, all that I've been talking about is because you're not listening. Shema Israel, hear, hear, be in the word, hear the word. And believe me, when you are in the word with the spirit leading you, it leaps off the page. It is not old antiquated words it is not dead words it is not a book of history except it is the history his story of yeshua hamashiach that is a living story it is alive it is powerful and it is life quite changing so as we come into these questions these two questions of why Yeshua, who isn't leaving any room for you to question why God. No, he's showing you that the, it's designed to reprove you. It's designed to correct you. It's designed to bring you to realize that the problem is on your end. That it isn't a failure of God. It's a failure of you to relate to God, to live in God's way through his greatness, with his power in your life. And there is no other way to look at it, no other way to be. If you take a vine growing on a great oak tree, it's wrapped around. One side of that vine will be very tight to the trunk of the tree, so tight that you really cannot peel it off. It's just clinging to it. The other side will be very loose. Do you know which side is tight? The side that the storm comes on. The, <laughs> the side that the wind blows on. That's what has made that little vine cling to that big root. And that's what God wants out of our storms. They're not meant to wash us away. We saw the devastation. I saw it on the, the Interstate 10 coming in tonight, what you all went through. And I understand it was scary in your human flesh. I understand that. But God's saying it's not here to wash you away. It's not here to wash it out. It's here because if in those storms we learn to clean. And we find out that we've got a solid root that we are clinging to. The root is Yeshua. He is our Messiah. He's our Savior. And he gives us unconditional promises. He says, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. I will never forsake you. And he tells us time and time again. So as we read this, as we go through it, Yeshua says he refers to the people as Yaakov and Israel. And we know that, that he's talking about a certain people that he's made covenant promise with. But I encourage you, those of us who are believers in Yeshua HaMashiach, we know God has made covenant with us also, given us sure promises also. And so we can enter into the application of what he has promised Israel, seeing that he is our creator God, seeing that he is a preserver of all things, that, that he is above everything and seeing that with those unconditional promises and those privileges given to us because when you're his kid you will have privileges and I love to be his kid and see that God is never forsaken. We find that when, when we look at these two verses why do you say Yaakov and you assert Israel 
Before I tell you what they're saying, that word is search, it can also be translated complain. And the idea from the Hebrew is, why are you continually complaining? Why are you persistent in this action? This is, apparently was a pattern with Judah. Judah. Apparently, their circumstances, they were constantly complaining. I can take us back to another time with Moshe, and we know they constantly complain. We we're told that. And I think we all have that problem in our difficulties and our adversities, that we are quick to complain. And yet this question is raised to rebuke that, to expose it, to bring it out, and to show them that's how far you are from your God. If you're complaining, you're moving away from your God. You're not anchored in the hope of the Lord. Remember, this is comfort. Comfort yourselves in the Lord. This is where it is. Your God hasn't forgotten you. Your God is not unconscious. Your God is not asleep. Your God is not unaware. But if you are moving away from him, you are not going to feel his companionship, his close presence, and his help. And that's why you can say in the next phrase, or Israel was saying at that time, my way is hidden from the Lord. Really? <laughs> really? The God who's over all, sees it all, knows it all, keeps it all, and is doing it all? Can, you can hide from him? <laughs> well, how successful was Adam and his wife when they tried to hide from God, when God came to walk with them in the cool of the evening? And we know that that, that phrase is either showing us unbelief or ignorance, one or the other. It's either unbelief in God's ability to know the details of our life and what's going on, or is ignorance. You don't really know God and His love. Because if you really know His love, how can you doubt? That's where our faith comes in. When we don't know His plan, when we can't see His hand, we trust His and he'll never let you down. To say that, that your way is hidden is to say he's too busy. He's taking care of a problem in Russia or over there in Israel. What does he know about Palm Desert or San Bernardino? <laughs> and I will tell you, he isn't ever too busy. He, 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 my mind is blown. He hears every prayer in every language at every moment that is coming. And he answers specifically. Amazing. And that's just the beginning. God declared his knowledge. He declared his love for Israel. He told them time and again, and I'm just going to bring you Dovery in Deuteronomy 11 and verse 12. It is a land, Adonai, your God cares for. Talking about the land of Israel. Remember, they're going to be cast out, but they're going to come back. In Dabarim, in Deuteronomy, he's saying it's a land that your God cares for. How much does God care for that land and his people in that land? It goes on and it says, The eyes of Adonai, your God, are always on it. Always. That means that his eyes were on Israel August 25th, 2023. The same way his eyes were on Israel when this was written. Oh my goodness, what would I say? Easily, easily more than a thousand BC. So 3,000 years ago plus. How often are his eyes on Israel? Always. And then he says that that's not enough from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. We're coming up on a new year again. We're starting over again on our calendar, our secular calendar. It's not our biblical. That is still, it's a new year. It's a new start. God's eyes are on us. They're on us September 14th in our Gregorian calendar and September 15th when we start that new year. Amos, our prophet Amos, chapter 9, verse says, Look, verse 8, I'm sorry, says, Look, the eyes of Adonai Elohim are on the sinful kingdom. And I say hallelujah to that because Israel, my beloved Israel today is full of sin. Now, I'm not going to tell you America is any better because it's not. But I am going to tell you Israel's not receiving the blessings that she should receive because she's not in right fellowship to receive them. But God says, 
even when you're sinful, my eyes are on you. I will wipe off the face of this earth, but I won't completely destroy the house of Yaakov, says Adonai. And that the warning is there. Judgment comes. There is the penalty. The wages of sin is death. But God says, I'll never make a full end to Israel. I'm faithful to my promises. He is the faithful God who gave unconditional, meaning they didn't merit it. They can't demerit it either. And God will keep his promise. So in this, as we look at this question, as we see in the justice, the, uh, the justice to me escapes the notice of my God. Here we're moving into what I believe is a good example of self-pity. It's not fair. <laughs> well, guess what, folks? It's not. <laughs> okay? <laughs> As we so often say nowadays, get over it. <laughs> okay? It's not going to be fair. This isn't the time of fairness and justice. When our Lord Messiah rules, when he's ruling with the rod of iron, then this world will see fair and just judgment. And right will be done for right. And wrong will be corrected. But this right now is showing a hardness of their souls. It's revealing their attitude. And really, I think they were full of self-pity, full of bitterness, full of frustration, rebellion. They were demanding, and they were angry when they weren't getting their way. Does that sound like the newspaper today? <laughs> when they weren't getting their own way, then it was, oh, my God's neglected me. And I want to say, really? He's neglected you. Really. Give me your proof. And let's talk about what's happening. Because my God doesn't neglect. And he doesn't forget. And the attitude that, well, nobody loves me. And everybody's doing me wrong. And I just, it's so self-centered. And where is our focus then? And remember where our focus needs to be? We've always got to have our focus on our God. We cannot expect everything to be fair and everything to be right. But in this, when the, they came out with this expression here in verse 20, the, the 27, I'm sorry, that justice due has escaped the notice of my God. They're saying as if, let's give you this example. You're on the freeway. You've broken down and you've stepped outside of your car and you're hoping someone's going to stop and help you and you watch car after car pass by and as each one does you feel a little more hopeless and a little less cared for and finally you say a whole world is going by and nobody cares that's what they were saying that's how they were judging their god as if he was oblivious to their needs but you know there's something very interesting in this in their phrase when they said, my way is hidden from the Lord, they used the name Yehovah. Do you know what that name means? That name is the great I am. That's the name that God made covenant with Israel. That's the name when he revealed himself with a special love, a special revelation, and the ultimate redemption. He uses that name, and they use that name. So it's as if they really know better, but they're full of self-pity, and they've got their view skewed. They've got an unfocused heart. They've got a foggy perception. They're full of themselves, and they're seeing the storm. And I'm just going to let you apply wherever you want to apply. I'm not <laughs> even going to go there, but I'm going to tell you what they need to see instead is the rainbow that comes out of the storm. It comes out of it. This is the old Job clinging tenaciously to his God. And in chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, when he had so much calamity was happening to him, if anyone could say it's unfair, it would be Job. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I will return there. Adonai gave, Adonai took, blessed be the name of Adonai. And then the next verse confirms it says, In all this yoke, neither committed a sin nor put the blame on God. Yeah. Yeah. Would we measure up? 
Wow. No. Yes, Yahoo, Isaiah 55, our next chapter, we stop short in 54. And oh, I wanted to read you 54 or 10 to tonight. And I will mm -hmm. read that real quickly and come right back to 55. It says, for the mountains may be removed. Thomas saying about the mountains all around yes. Israel tonight. Let us in that. And I thought, here we are. Thomas and I are on the same page again without talking to each other. But my God is awesome mm -hmm. and amazing. The, for the mountains may be removed, the hills may shake. But my loving kindness will not be removed from you. And my covenant of shalom will not be shaken. Who says it? Rochelle? Um, then you're in trouble. No. You're, <laughs> the one you're leaning on, you're in trouble. But no, it says, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Is that not beautiful? Yes. And then chapter 55, verses 8 and 9 tell us God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts than our thoughts and I think to myself yes who is this little speck of dust remember how little we saw we were last week when we saw the, the relation of the size of earth to the universe to our God and that little speck has the audacity to say to God you're not doing it right it's not fair you're letting me down really <laughs> Again, and my other way of always saying it, the little four-year-old that wants to run the household and thinks they know it all right, you can't understand why candy is not a good dinner. <laughs> <laughs> we move on in this chapter, and I've got a little more time. Yay, how did I manage that? <laughs> we're, we're looking at, those of you who have been with me know it long enough know why they're laughing. <laughs> uh, I think we're ready for verse 28. Uh, yes. You do know, you not in Isaiah 40? Okay. Yeah, back to Isaiah 40, sorry. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Okay, here comes the second set of questions. Either their knowledge is inadequate, you don't know enough, or you have failed to really listen. Mm -hmm. One way or another, the Word of God does not give you room for this attitude. And that's what he brings out. When you apply the word of God, remember, comfort ye, comfort ye, says the Lord. If you want to know his comfort, you've got to know what he says. And no real comfort is going to come apart from God and apart from his word. Nothing will. Everything else in life will fail you. Everything else will let you down. As soon as you lean on a human, you will find out that person is human. Yeah. Really? Just a person. Just a person. Go figure. <laughs> Flesh and blood and used to be worth about 75 cents. We might have an increase. Maybe we're worth 80 cents now in our minerals. But the comfort is in God. And to question his love, to question his justice, is to not have the view right. And this is what he brings out to them again, that they've got to have this view. The everlasting God the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. Do you see his power and his majesty in that? Mm -hmm. And then it says he does not become weary or tired. Do you realize when he's got how many kids all hollering at him for something and being needy and crying out and in confusion and he's trying to, not trying, but he is meeting all those needs and it never wears him out. You know, as a teacher, I used to get worn out. <laughs> 30 little ones all hollering at the same time. By the end of the school day, when they go out of the room and you come back in and it was just quiet, and you... <sighs> God never does that. And he's got more than 30 kids. <laughs> he's amazing. He is our God. And if we would just simply learn a four-letter word, and I know we don't like four-letter words, but this one is the one we need to learn. And it is here. It's going to be brought out very clearly. And if you don't know it, that word is wait. Wait on the Lord. That's hard. We're going to see in verses 28 to 31, and I'm going to take it, even if I push us right up to the limit, because I can't break this in the middle. This crescendo, you've got to have it together. The promises in these verses are for those who do wait on the Lord. They're going to find new strength that's going to carry them through. They're going to find comfort that gives strength. You know, when somebody is comforting you, when they wrap their arms around you, 
it is a comfort. When you're the one in tears and someone strong is holding on to you, you feel that comfort. Run into his arms. Feel his arms around you. Know his comfort because he is our comforter. Remember that was one of the names he gave earlier in this chapter, that he is our comforter. And he will give you strength. And I love it because this is my God. While you're learning to wait on him. He doesn't say, get all right and then come to me. It's while you are learning. While you're learning to wait on him. And look at what we rest in. In the first 28, we're going to see we rest in God's sovereignty. He is the one in charge. The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. He is sovereign. You're talking to the boss. You're talking to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. You're talking to the one whose throne is on high. And remember, he is seated in perfect shalom. Mm -hmm. That's who you see as you wait on him. This one who never grows weary or tired. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives strength to the weary, verse 29. And the one who lacks, the one who lacks might, he increases power. Now we have not only the sovereign God, but we see again his omnipotence. We see the power. The problem isn't because God's weak. That's not why you've got a problem. He doesn't become weary. He doesn't become tired. When Moshe would let his arms down, the battle was fierce. When they kept his arms up, they saw the victory. The arms up, looking to the God, praising their God, relying on their God. It's not for us to say we, we've got to not be tired is that we've got to be in him so that he brings us that strength, that ability that we do not become weary in well-doing. Then we will reap when we don't faint. That's Galatians chapter 3. But he, he tells us he's sovereign. No worries. I'm in control. I'm all-powerful. Then he says in verse 20, also, he's omniscient. His way of doing, it says that he is, uh, let me just read it for you. We are, we're back in 28, sorry, I thought we were in 29. His understanding is unsearchable. That means it's inscrutable. You can't, you can't check him out and find a mistake or a problem. He understands everything. You think you understand your problem, and you're just going, but God, but God, but God. Well, I'll tell you what you need to do is take that big butt and that little God, and you need to switch it and have a little butt and a big God and say, but God, there's my problem. Problem? God's got it. My brother used to say, and I hear him again and again and again, he's got this. That's what you need to tell your problem. He's got this. But God, remember, behold your God. He's yours. He's mine. And we don't have to take turns. He can be there for both of us at the same moment. And when we see that and when we feel that and when we know he gives strength to the weary, verse 29, to the one who lacks his might, he increases power. And then we see the strength come. Verse 30, though youths grow weary and tired, you know, even the little ones, that we've, that we've talked, if we could bottle their energy <laughs> and sell it, even they grow tired. Even they get weary. The vigorous young men, they stumble badly. That's not where it's at. That's human power. And that's not what it's about. Remember, it's his power. It's his love. It's his comfort. It's his grace. It's his wisdom. It's his way. And he says in verse 31, Yet those who wait on the Lord will gain new strength. Did you catch that? New strength. You don't go back to the old. You'll grow stronger. You'll come out of that trial. You'll realize as you've waited on the Lord, you have grown in strength. You've grown in trust. You've grown in all of these ways that we've been describing. And when we look at the Hebrew word for wait, it's kava. And it's to gather together, to look, to patiently tarry, to wait for, on, or upon. <clears throat> and an example that they used to give was taking two ropes and twisting them together 
and then using that sometimes for an anchor, for whatever it was. It was so strong that it could have something heavy on the end and it wouldn't unravel. That's behind that word weight. We don't think of it in that way. But I see it as if I take and I wrap myself around that root, remember the vine and the tree, which side is strong? When I cling to my God and I allow him to wrap around me, nothing can break. Nothing can penetrate. Nothing gets through. Are you soaring? <laughs> well, guess what? That's exactly where we're going. Those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. Do you know that eagles get new wings? They, they, I don't remember. I should have studied it, but there is the, 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 the object lesson behind that also. Their wings, the span, their ability, God formed them perfectly. And all the, the wings do, the way it works together, I, if I thought it would have brought to my attention so I could tell you again, but study it. I'll tell you, do that for your homework this week. Google it about the eagle's wings and see how God applies that in your life and you will be amazed at what our God does. But in this point and with the, the little bit of time I have left, we're mounting up with wings like eagles. We are finding endurance. We are able to run the race. We're able to finish. I had a friend that was doing long distance marathon running. She was on her own and she had kind of partnered with a couple others because as you run 26 miles, you kind of, the ones that you're around the most of the time, they kind of draw encouragement and support from them. But as they approach the finishing line, each one of those others had someone on the sidelines that came and started cheering them on and she watched each one leave her in the dust. She didn't have anybody there cheering her on and she saw it, it just gave them such a new energy. That's what our Lord is doing. I have a beautiful picture of my mom. She's in heaven, God bless her memory. When I was on a basketball team, my mom was the best cheerleader we could ever have. And I had that position where I get the ball, I break with it, and I run down the court. That's where I had my ability. It wasn't getting that high in the basket. Get that to the tall girls and let them put it in. But I could crawl through those legs and they never saw me. And every time when I would turn and start taking that ball down the court, I could see my mom at the end of the line, you know, sitting with the others. Go, go, and she's about out of her seat. Go, go, and it would, it would pick me up, and I would just soar down that. That, even exhausted, even out of breath, it would do something. That's what God's doing. That's what He's doing. He's picking us up. He's giving us new wings. He's lifting us. If we allow our battles and our burdens, they're not to bend us over and bring us down to this earth. They're to give us wings that bring us closer to our. And when you get in his very presence, wow, amazing what you will see, what you will understand, and even what you don't understand, that is suddenly not the battle anymore. And you have that shalom, shalom. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is what he promises. They will stand firm and they will prevail. Daniel, Daniel chapter 11, 32 says, But the people who know their God will display strength and take action. They'll stand firm and they'll prevail. We've got two choices and we always have two choices. You can choose to spare you can lean on your own understanding. You can turn to man's devices. You can turn to drugs. You can turn to alcohol. You can turn to whatever this world is offering you. You can think, well, I'll get enough wealth, and in my wealth I'll have everything I need. I'll buy it all. I'll have it all. That's your choice. And I guarantee you, you will not soar with the eagles, <laughs> and you will not know this comfort that my God is offering you free and constantly. Or you can learn, and I'll say it again, behold your God. Amen. And when you're in that relation, trust Him. 
act on his promises and realize this is love. This is love. Chris wanted me to talk about love tonight. I'm going to close it with love. You want to know the love God had toward Israel? Hosea, Hosea chapter 2, verses 19 and 20 and 23. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in forever. In righteousness, in justice, in grace, in compassion. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. You will know Adonai. I will sow her for me in the land. I will have pity on those. Where they say, you are not my people, I will say, you are my people. And I will say, you are my. We're allowed to say that. Because even though he's giving this to Israel, the principle is there for all those who come in a relationship with him. First John 4, 10 and 11, here is what love is. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the Kippur, the propitiation. We'll talk long about that at Yom Kippur for our sins. Beloved friend, if this is how God loved us, shouldn't we also love others. Mm -hmm. Revelation 21 tells us there's a new holy city, the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven. It's like it's decked out like the bride for her bridegroom. And verse 3 is one of my favorite verses. They will tabernacle. Mm -hmm. God says, I will tabernacle among men. He will dwell among them. He will uh, be, they will be his people and God himself will be among them. Mm -hmm. Do you know we get to tabernacle with God now? Mm -hmm. We don't have to wait for the eternal city. Because God put His Spirit within us. And if you truly have His Spirit within, how can you fear? How can you worry? How can you say it's not fair and have a self-pity attitude? And how can you not know this love that gives you wings? This is my God. This is the blood. This is what He is saying. Comfort ye. Comfort ye. My people. Thus says the Lord. Behold your God. Hallelujah. <laughs>